Here we are once again. This is the Physics 105A video lecture. The Physics 105A video lecture 9. And we'll start off with some announcements, namely that there's an exam on Friday from 9 to 11 a.m. in keeping with our regular meeting hours. And I've extended it a bit. I think two hours will be fine. Then you can get it back to me in good form. With, you know, it'll have a timestamp. Two hours, good amount of time. Open notes, obviously. So I won't have to give you a formula sheet. I'll just give you several problems that'll you'll find them interesting anyway. And uh, I kind of changed my mind. I'm, we're just going to keep going with Kepler's laws, okay? And the review that I do at the end of the hour will be pretty short, but it'll be adequate. Okay, everything you need is in your notes. And uh, what I've put up here on the board is some formulas that we'll use more than just once. So I'll just leave them up here and hopefully I can just, they're up in the glare, but it's not that bad. And I'll work on the bottom board here. So yeah, we're looking at Kepler's laws and we had assembled everything we need last time and, and even gotten into Kepler's first law. So let's go ahead and reassemble everything here. So we had found using you know, using these two differential equations, we integrated them up, um, and we had then found r as a function of p, and it's in the polar form of the conic section, so it's r is equal to p over 1 plus p cosine p. So we have to play around with that a bit in order to see what it means. And P is the parameter, and let's get that down there, um, L squared over M alpha, and E is the eccentricity root 1 plus 2 L squared E over M alpha squared. So we have those two things there, and let's see if we get a better So that's the, that's the ellipse. And I brought a string, remember the other day at the other chalkboard, I didn't have magnetic capability. Here we do, so I wanna draw some ellipses. That's worth the price of admission alone. Okay, so we don't know whether or not this is an ellipse. I'm gonna draw the ellipse this time. I'll draw a couple and then I'll draw one and label it. So if you take a loop of string, and of course, I could draw a circle. The definition would be that a set of points that's equidistant from this one point center of the circle. But I'll go straight to the ellipse. And an ellipse with these two foci close together, see if we can pull this off here. Okay. So when the foci are close together, then you remove them. This is hardly distinguishable from a circle, okay? But it's an ellipse and you saw by the construction that there were two foci about this far apart, okay? So we're going to do one that's a little more stretched out and label it. Yeah, so this time, this will be our official ellipse. Let's see, we'll put the foci about this far apart. And let's see what we get. Uh, maybe not quite that. Okay. Let's see what we get is a curve that I can never draw by hand. This is actually a very beautiful curve, the ellipse. There's the construction principle. So there, that's the official ellipse, and I'm going to mark the foci the best I can. There's one, and here's the other focus. Okay, so there's a real 
beautiful ellipse with which we can illustrate and discuss Kepler's laws. So Kepler's first law, the orbits of the planets are ellipses with the sun at one focus. We'll call that the focus, at which the sun is this over here, just a mystery spot. There's nothing there. Okay. Um, in between here, I like to put a little star. That's the geometrical center of mass. And I labeled this distance here D. Okay. That distance there was D. Then we had the semi-major axis. That was 2A from here to here. And the semi-minor axis, 2B here to here. And if A equals B equals R, you have a circle. Okay. Um, in our XY coordinate system, this was X and I'll do dotted line here. This was Y. Okay. So the thing is shifted. Okay, the, okay. Origin is not there, the origin is right here. Yeah, then in terms of parameter and eccentricity, by the way, I missed E here. Oh, what am I okay. So we've got E right there. 2L squared E over M alpha squared. So then we found A and B and D in terms of these quantities here. And what we had found was that A is equal to B 1 minus D squared. B is equal to B over the root of 1 minus D squared. And this D here was equal to E times D over 1 minus D squared. Yeah. 1 minus D. Okay. So now everything is in place. Put that comma here. So I'm going to do Kepler's laws each time on this half of the board. Okay. So Kepler's first law. First one was that the orbits of the planets around the sun our ellipses with the sun at one focus. So what we had to do here was write or prove that x plus d squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared is equal to 1. So that was a homework problem, and I'm leaving it to you guys to do. But what you're doing is you're making all of these substitutions. So first of all, your x is your r cos phi. Okay. There's your r. You have to take this, multiply by cosine phi. Your y is your r sine phi. Same thing. Then you have your d in terms of this right here. Okay. Um, and your a like this as well. So what you're going to find is you put the, you set this whole thing up. P actually cancels out. Okay. P will cancel and you'll just have a bunch of e's and ones and cosines and sines and so forth. And you just have to multiply everything out, you know, and eventually you got one equals one and you're happy. Okay. But only then have we shown have we demonstrated Kepler's first law. Okay. So that has to be done. What about the second law? It's gonna be interesting. The second law was the law of areas. And it was that the radius vector sweeps out equal areas and equal times. Um, different color. Now, I'll use this picture and carefully erase. So we could say we had an area here. And as we're doing our counterclockwise orbit. And then out, way out here to the left, we'd have a much more slender area. Okay. And we're saying equal area than equal times. Well, we have to prove that. Okay. Is that available right here? In fact, we don't even need the full Newton's law on this. So here's what I'm going to do. Area DA, it's the area of a triangle, so it's basically one half 
r squared d phi because you've got r and then you've got r d phi right here. Okay, that's not the answer. So one half r times r d phi, one half r squared d phi. And because of that, we can say that dA dt, the time derivative of this area being swept out, is one half r squared d phi dt. But, and this is pretty great, r squared over two, d phi dt, which we have right here, is equal to L over mr squared. So we have L over mr squared. The r squared is cancel. That's L over 2m. And that, of course, is a constant. Because L is not angular momentum, it's conserved. So the conservation, or the, con the equal areas in equal times law of Kepler is really just conservation of angular momentum. It holds true, therefore, any central force. Not just the Newton's law one over R squared force. Okay, so conservation of angular momentum. So we have dA dP equals L over 2M equals a constant. Okay, so that's Kepler's second law. Area swept out, equal areas and equal times. Okay, so not bad. Now, Kepler's third law, and I'll go ahead and erase this part of the board. Okay, Kepler's third law was the law of the periods. So three. there. We had, you know, the t squared proportional to a to the 3 half. That's what we have to prove. Let's go ahead and take a look at this expression we had. So we had this dA dt was just equal to L over 2m. And what we're going to do is integrate this with respect to time. So if we integrate this with respect to time, over an entire period of orbit, so t is the period of orbit, then we will sweep out the entire ellipse, and that area that we'll get will be the area of the ellipse. So on the one hand, we have L over 2m, which is constant, so pull the constant out, times t. And on the other hand, it's the area of an ellipse, which is phi ad. So L over 2m times t, the period is equal to pi ab, which is the area of the ellipse. Okay, so let's make use of these expressions here. So I'll say or L over 2m p is equal to pi times a. Now the thing about b and a is that they have a very similar form here, and if we want to write b down, we can take the square root of a and multiply it by the square root of p. So b is equal to a to the one half, p to the one half, and there we already see it. I'm going to clean this up a bit. But, so we're going to have t squared a cubed right out of this thing here. I'll put it in a slightly different form, although we see it here already. Let's go ahead and multiply over. We'll have t is equal to 2 pi up the two there, m over l, p to the one half, and p to the one half is l 
over root m alpha. So L over root m alpha, and then we'll have the A to the 3 halves power, or D is equal to 4 pi squared. L canceled. Um, root m over alpha a cubed. Did I square both sides? Yeah, two squared. So yeah, we have Kepler's third law. And this brings us to a point uh, that I had mentioned earlier in the semester. So we're going to work through the this thing a little bit more. Kepler's third law. Actually, first let's do a check with check with the circular orbits. Remember when we quasi derived Newton's law of gravity, right? Using circular orbits and Kepler's third law. That's how we got. Okay, that's how we started. We took circular orbits, Kepler's third law. And then we obtained Newton's law of gravity in the one over r squared form. So let's go ahead and talk about these circular orbits again. For a circular orbit, you know, Newton's law can be written as alpha over r squared is equal to m v squared over r, right? There's your force law, we're just using alpha as that constant. There is your mass times centripetal acceleration. Okay. Um, yeah, this is very quickly done. So we've got alpha over r squared equals m. So we'll take a 2 pi r squared over t squared, where t is the period of orbit. That's, you know, the speed is 2 pi r over t. Okay. So we have one more power of r. So yeah, if you reduce this thing, you're going to get exactly this right here. Just cross multiply with the t squared. You got your r cubed. You got your m over alpha. Um, actually, the m over alpha should, here it was the square root. So here, got that in real time. Good. Good for us. OK, make sure you've got that. And then you're, you'll see we'll have exactly the same thing off of this. Okay. So leave a little room in your notes. Make sure you're clear on that. That's kind of a nice exercise. So we have Kepler's three laws now deduced from Newton's law of gravity and the whole formalism. So we got the ellipses back. The law of areas we got simply from uh, angular momentum, which is interesting, and we've got Kept, um, third law here, law of periods. Of course, it's more general. In fact, there's a topic that I'm thinking of talking about after the exam where we can actually deduce the inverse square law rigorously. You know, the deduction I did the other day, a couple days ago, that deduction was uh, it was very basic. It was off of a circular orbit, and then you could say you could have that great generalization. But now that we have the formalism, we can actually deduce from um, from this and this the central force formalism. We can deduce that if you have this form of the trajectory, that the force must be one over r squared. So we would do that after the exam. That's an interesting thing as well. But now we have Kepler's three laws. And I have at least one more point to talk about.
is the third law on the one hand. And that problem we did early in the semester where we had the time of a particle to fall in okay, to a central point of attraction at the linear, the time to fall in linear. So third law and um, the linear case, I'll call it here for lack of a better term. So here's what we had. We had point, and this was on the homework. I don't know what we named it, but we could just as well name it lowercase a now. We had the time it took for a particle to fall into the center of attraction. M here, we had M released from rest. From rest, I'll remind you, if you don't find your own version of that, you can do the integral again anyway. So, etc. time, and what was that? We had one half m x dot squared uh, minus alpha over x is equal to minus alpha over, well, the distance of a over a. We did this, and then we did the quadrature integral dt is equal to, I'll call it tau, is equal to so and so. And that was the time to fall into that central attractive point. And as you recall, we had that tau squared was proportional to a cubed as well. And what we want to do is reconcile the third law of Kepler with this result for the linear case. In fact, the tau squared proportional to a cubed we had on um, just from that dimensional analysis alone. Okay. When we got the uh, dimensional integral so far. So how can we reconcile the two? Um, so I'm just going to call this homework, discuss this example and Kepler's third law. And you know I'm going to do the discussion right now because it's a great, great example of talk about it. What I will do is erase this ellipse and do one more really challenge, challenging of this. Let's see what we can do right here. Okay, this ellipse I'll erase, and then we'll try to get this discussion going. Now, what I want to do is get the eccentricity as high as I can, and because these pins are a little fat, I can only put them this far apart, so I'm going to have my loci right here. Let's see if we can pull this off. So this too is an ellipse. Okay. That's not bad. So there's a focus. Here's a focus. Yeah, there's an ellipse. If we're doing astronomy, maybe this would be a comet, Halley's Comet or something. We'll spend a lot of time way out there. But we want to take a take this limit even further. Now, if I had little pins here that were much lower in diameter, I could even stretch the ellipse out more. It seems like there's nothing stopping me from having an ellipse where the semi-minor axis is vanishingly small compared to the semi-major axis. I can do that. And that's what we want to discuss. So we still have the 2b and the 2a. Love to do the other construction, but this is as far as we can do it. But yeah, we can make them as flat as we want. So in that limit, you know, we could have something really flat, and then these foci would be tucked away right in the corner. So mathematically, it seemed like we could take the limit 
as b over a goes to zero. Okay. So good, I'm going to erase that having said that point, made that point there. Okay. So this problem here, this tau, we discussed this thing. The first thing we see is that that time for the falling in here, if it's related to Kepler's third law, it will be half of the period of this Keplerian orbit for the infinitely flat ellipse. So for this very, very flat ellipse that I just drew, this tau, so here's what we're going to write. You see tau would be identified with the period of that entire Keplerian orbit over 2. Okay. It'll be equal to that in that, in that appropriate limit. So the, the next thing we have to talk about is that appropriate limit here. So I'll say what about B divided by A? And we'll see that B divided by A is P over root 1 minus e squared divided by therefore times 1 minus e squared over p. Those cancel and we cancel a square root so that is equal to the square root of 1 minus e squared. So the case we're looking at is apparently the, uh, the case where e, the eccentricity, goes to 1. This is the case where um, E approaches 1. That's what those ultra flat ellipses are. Yeah, so if E approaches 1, then you could go back to A here because that, okay, you go back to the semi major axis, which is the one that survives, and you'd say, wait a minute. If E goes to 1, my semi-major axis is diverging. Okay, that's not allowed to happen, is it? But then you come back to this definition here, and you see if E goes to 1, what has to happen? Energy equals 0? No. What has to happen is the angular momentum has to vanish or become very small. And the angular momentum becoming small is exactly what's going on here. Because in the limit that you have this lim linear case where the, the motion is just in a straight line, the angular momentum actually is zero. Okay. So there's a full concept, you know, all of these things check out to be consistent. And all I want you to do, well, think about the whole thing and then make sure that our expressions that we got from this integral here and that we got from Kepler's third law are in fact identical and consistent. Okay. okay, that's a really interesting and nice problem. Um, and it actually reminds us that this central force formalism, right, with the conserved angular momentum and the cons right, conserved angular momentum and energy, this central force formalism will also work when L is equal to zero. We haven't actually talked about that case. So the linear case is actually built into the central force formalism. And I have an interesting kind of tricky little problem that I'll probably put on the exam that uh, makes use of that, in fact. Okay. So the linear force, uh, the linear case is built in. Um, okay. Everything's consistent. Let's see how long we've gone for right now. We are at the 30 minute mark. That's not bad. Okay. So I think I'll even start with the case that I just ended up talking about because I may put something on the final today. Good. Okay. I'm going to erase all of this and we want to talk about oscillations, we want to talk about Fourier expansions and stuff, we want to talk about central force, which we've been talking about. Well, let's see here.
Yeah, we're not actually done with central force, although we made it through Kepler's laws, fair and square. So that's a big moment. Um, yeah. So I'm going to just give a mention of what comes next in central force. Because the thing here is there are many topics, more than we can actually even do. But one thing we're going to investigate, you know, after the exam, but to talk about right now, is circular and nearly circular orbits. Circular orbits and nearly circular orbits. And you know, you can take the nearly circular orbit as a perturbation of the circular orbit, and that allows for some really convenient formalisms. Um, and it's a very realistic situation because if the eccentricity is small, the orbits are nearly cir very close to circular, as I demonstrated with that construction at the beginning of this hour. Okay. So circular, nearly circular orbits um, is going to be a major topic. Another interesting topic is the deduction of the force law. So it's, you know, the formal exact version, deduction of the force law from the trajectory. That would be an interesting one because then you could say, and you know, I don't know if Newton had that formalism or if he did the crude version. He probably did both. But uh, given an, an ellipse, you can prove, um, the one I just erased, given an ellipse, you can prove that that force law has to be 1 over r squared. And given all manner of other trajectories, you can find their force laws. So that's interesting in that regard as well. So the deduction of the force law from the trajectory. And a third thing we can do that I usually do in the second semester, but would actually fit in would be talking about scattering and collisions. Collisions and scattering. Like I said, I usually do this, we definitely do it in the second semester, but if we did it sooner, it would, this formalism would be really fresh in our mind. And in particular, we can do the Rutherford scattering, which you guys have heard of. And you know, that would be a, actually a, a nice major application of this whole thing. So that's next in central force. And coming back to our review version of central force, I will just make a few points that I want you to have. And they're, you know, they're basically what's up here. So maybe I'll just work backwards on this. If you have this drawing right here, you have two particles. And I did a construction that showed that if I call this separation, this displacement vector r equals r1 minus r2, and I use this reduced mass, m1, m2, m1 plus m2, then that reduced to m r second derivative equals, right, then that reduced to an effective one body problem. So this m that we've been talking about all through our Kepler problem now has always been the reduced mass. Um, the, so having that, then the u of r was just integral like that, x minus sign. So if I give you some central force, you want to be able to integrate up and get the potential energy. You get the potential energy, you have energy conservation as well. So from that you have 1 half m r dot squared plus u of r is equal to e, so you get conservation of energy. And then Conservation of angular momentum has also been demonstrated. And it's from here 
that when you go to plane polar coordinates, that we get this formalism here. So these top two equations are always the central force problem, except instead of minus alpha over r for the Newton law, you have whatever this integral gave you. Okay. In particular, if it were, if it were uh, a Hooke's law, you'd have a half k r squared. Okay. Good. So there's that. So you know, and then you know, you've got the u effective potential. So I'm just going to write u effective equals l squared over 2mr squared plus u of r. And then I'll just redraw the generic thing for the, for the new potential. But yeah, then you want to go be able to go down to here. So it's always these steps, and then you want to memorize those steps. And then once you have a graph like this, you can analyze it for its circular orbits and for any other features. Okay, because now it's just one variable count. Good, so yeah, you definitely want to be able to follow that progression of ideas. And since it's open notes, you're going to have the progression of ideas right in front of you. Okay. Good, so that's with the central force. Um, we're, we, we, for the most part, take it into the analysis of the effective potential. And then, if we do that, we can also draw our conclusions about what's going on in the orbit by thinking about this expression here, the angular, you know, the angular motion part of the thing. One thing that, remember, we had found was that if you have that bounded potential with a local minimum, you've got the case that you can have an orbit between a minimum and a maximum. So that's the kind of thing you also want to be aware of. Okay. So that should actually suffice for central force. Anything else would be given the game away. Okay. So what about Fourier? Um, so yeah, we spent quite a bit of time and effort on complex numbers, Fourier series, Fourier integrals. And there, let's just have everything in place, and I'll give you a couple of interesting problems to do. So when I said the Fourier series, we had for some function between minus pi and pi, we generalized to different intervals, but for an exam question, it's going to keep it simple, minus pi to pi. And then we could write this kind of sum, c sub k e to the i kx. K went through the full set of integers, and C sub K was 1 over 2 pi. F of X equals minus I K X D X. And yeah, so there's the, you integrate over all the X's, there's your K referred to that K right there. So we would have those, the real form, is sometimes more useful. A0 over 2, the A sub k cosine kx, B sub k sine kx. Okay, you guys have these in your notes. I'm not going to belabor the whole thing. But oftentimes these are easier to use. So you have to have both in your repertoire. And you can sometimes try it both ways. You can try it one way or the other, depending upon what you're after depending on what you're after. Um, let's see. Even the Fourier integrals, you know, it's a short exam, so any example I give you will just be nice. Okay, a nice, clean little example, nothing too fussy. Um, and if it is a little fussy, then you just take it as far as you can and, and send it into me. Yeah, so what about the integrals? Well, I had those integral formulas as well. I had intended to do a bunch of complex analysis towards the end of the semester, but we're more likely to do what I just had up there on the board. It would be a good way to go as well. We could save the complex analysis for next semester. Um, but nonetheless, we had had these integrals as well. 
where we have the Fourier transform dk and the f hat of k is equal to integral f of x d to the minus i k x x so dk dx 1 over 2 pi on the full real axis. So yeah, if we do something with these, it also has to be pretty basic. But they were important and we did enough work on them. Finally, let me say something about the oscillation. Oscillation. Here I'm also thinking about that complex formalism, complex numbers formalism. I don't know if I got the chance to draw attention to its relation to these Fourier integrals that we have finally gotten to. Um, but we also had the, so for the oscillation part of the review, I'm just going to mention the undamped but driven, undamped driven oscillation. So that was when we had this differential equation equals f of t over m, okay? So the f of t equals zero, of course, it's just a harmonic oscillator, and we went through a couple of interesting ones, and we had this formalism where we went into the complex numbers And then we finally had an expression for C of T, right, which we've written down many times. And then finally, what we were looking for, X of T, is the imaginary part divided by omega naught. Okay. Because what you did in this formalism, you solved for this number, which contains, it's complex and it has the velocity and the position, but this is the imaginary part. So the imaginary part is always the thing that's multiplied by i. And if you divide this imaginary part, I'll just write that here, imaginary part. See, if you divide it by omega naught, you're back to x, which is what you started out wanting to find us. Okay, so we did a couple of those, and if I could come up with a nice one for us to do, then that would be a, a type of problem as well. So yeah, we could do something with this, we could do some, some Fourier series, we could do some central force problems, and that'll round, <coughs> that'll round things out pretty nicely here. So yeah, look all that stuff up. And coming back to my opening announcement. Um, yeah, as always, right, take good notes. I think that's one of the most important things we can do under the current circumstances and, uh, and master them. So yeah, I will email the exam at 9 in the morning and then I'll get them back. Definitely make sure that uh, it's a very clear picture. Sometimes the pictures print out extremely dark. It, it depends on what, what uh, format you're using to scan them. But as long as I can read them really well, that's good. If I can print them out really clearly, of course, that's better. Good. That's how it's going to be. I'll send out an email before Friday, just giving a general heads up on what I said right here. And then we'll do this. Okay, good. See you guys next time.